Ja, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich begrüßen zu unserem heutigen MMK-Talk in der aktuellen Reihe Kunst und Körper. Wir haben heute zwei ganz besondere Gäste und ich freue mich sehr zu begrüßen Ed Atkins, der vor einigen Wochen hier eine große Ausstellung eröffnet hat. Und Thomas Oberender, der Intendant der Berliner Festspiele, der in diesem Sommer im Martin-Gropius-Bau eine noch viel größere, beneidenswerterweise noch viel größere Ausstellung mit Ed Atkins zeigen wird. Obwohl Sie natürlich jetzt inzwischen, äh, viele von Ihnen Ed Atkins natürlich sehr gut kennen, einige von Ihnen arbeiten auch im Moment mit ihm zusammen, möchte ich trotzdem unsere beiden Gäste kurz vorstellen. Ähm, ja, Ed Atkins... Äh, gehört zu einer jüngeren Generation oder jungen Generation von Künstlerinnen und Künstlern, die man landläufig und bestimmt falscherweise so als Post-Internet-Generation äh, bezeichnet, was auch, immer, was auch immer das bedeuten mag. Aber was diese Generation von Künstlerinnen und Künstlern vereint, ist eben, dass sie sich sozusagen mit den Folgen der digitalen Medien auf äh, die Wahrnehmung und die Selbstdefinition des Menschen heute, dass sie sich damit kritisch reflektieren. Und Ed Atkins ist einer, der dieses Thema schon wahnsinnig früh aufgegriffen hat, als extrem junger Künstler und wirklich einer der absoluten Vorreiter in diesem Feld ist. Er lebt und arbeitet äh, im Moment in Berlin und ich glaube auch noch in London. Er hat an drei äh, sehr, sehr guten Schulen studiert, Ox in Oxford an der Brooks University, am Central St. Martins College of Art, And Design und an der Slate School of Art. Er ist äh, in den letzten, ich sag mal so, fünf Jahren wirklich in sehr, sehr vielen Ausstellungen zu sehen, äh, sehr viele Ausstellungsbeteiligungen. Er kommt gerade zurück aus Montreal, wo er eine Einzelausstellung eröffnet hat. 2016 hatte er eine große Einzelausstellung im Castello di Rivoli in Turin, davor in Kopenhagen im Statens Museum vor Kunst. 2015 im Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, 2014 in der Serpentine Sackler Gallery, im Palais de Tokio in Paris, in der Kunsthalle Zürich, also das sind wirklich nur die allergrößten Namen, Julia Stosche Collection in Düsseldorf, MoMA PS1, Chisholm Hale Gallery damals in London, sehr früh noch 2012, also er ist wirklich ein sehr, ähm, ja, wie soll man sagen, sehr erfolgreicher Künstler. Dann äh, war er natürlich in den letzten Jahren ganz vielen Ausstellungen beteiligt. Ich möchte nur zwei, drei wichtige Ausstellungsbeteiligungen nennen. Das war äh, vor allem 2015 die Istanbul Biennale. Das war diese tolle Ausstellung 14 Rooms von Hans-Ulrich Obrist in Basel. Das waren die Biennalen in Venedig und Lyon 2013 und eben vieles mehr. Und in diesem Jahr folgen auch noch viele Ausstellungen, nicht nur die Ausstellung im martin Gropius bau sondern dann auch noch Helsinki Chiasma Museum of Contemporary Art. Er wird die Julia Stosche Collection kuratieren. Will you curate the Stosche Collection in Düsseldorf or in Berlin? Ah, this is very good. So we will meet again in Düsseldorf. I'm looking forward to that. Und eben martin Gropius bau in Berlin. Ja, Thomas Oberender ist ähm, nicht nur der Intendant der Berliner Festspiele, sondern er ist Autor, Dramaturg, Essayist. Er hat an der Humboldt-Universität Theaterwissenschaften studiert und er hat über den Schriftsteller und Dramatiker Botho Strauß promoviert. Seit 2012 ist er Intendant der Berliner Festspiele und hat dort schon wahnsinnig viel bewegt, sehr, sehr interessante Projekte realisiert. Ähm, davor, 2006 bis 2011, war er Schauspieldirektor der Salzburger Festspiele. In den Jahren davor Chefdramaturg und Co-Direktor am Schauspielhaus Zürich. Davor, 2000 bis 2005, leitender Dramaturg und Mitglied der Künstlerischen Direktion am Schauspielhaus Bochum mit Matthias Hartmann. Also auch er hat wirklich an tollen Häusern gearbeitet. Er hat aber auch Theaterstücke geschrieben, Essays geschrieben, Literaturkritiken geschrieben. Er hat Projekte realisiert für die Expo 2000, für die Ruhr-Triennalen 2004 und 2005, für die Kulturhauptstadt Europa Ruhr 2010. Er hat 
einige Bücher veröffentlicht. Das letzte war 2014 mit und über Peter Handke, Nebeneingang oder Haupteingang, Gespräche über 50 Jahre Schreiben fürs Theater. Also seit äh, 2012 ist er eben Intendant der Berliner Festspiele, seit 2016 hat er dort ein neues Programm aufgelegt, dessen Kurator er ist, Kurator er ist, das nennt sich Immersion, analoge Künste im digitalen Zeitalter. Und in diesem Kontext haben wir auch schon öfters miteinander uns ausgetauscht und in diesem Kontext wird er auch eben mit Ed Atkins diese große Ausstellung im Martin Gropius Bau kuratieren. Ähm, er wird jetzt dieses Gespräch führen mit Ed Atkins und natürlich aus seiner Perspektive, die vor allem eine Perspektive des Theaters ist, aber sicherlich nicht ausschließlich. Der Talk wird auf Englisch stattfinden ähm, und ich möchte mich an dieser Stelle noch ganz herzlich bei unserem Sponsor seit vielen Jahren bedanken, die Deutsche Bank Stiftung ähm, finanziert und ermöglicht diese Reihe der MMK Talks jetzt schon im siebten Jahr. Meinen ganz herzlichen Dank dafür. Ja, ich übergebe das Wort an <lacht> Thomas Oberender und Ed Atkins. So. Thank you very much for this introduction, um, Susanne. And um, yeah, we will have a real talk. It's not a, it's not 100 questions. Uh, they are not ready. I hope <laughs> <laughs> we will find a way to uh, have a real conversation. And I will uh, start with the dirty nails uh, uh, on the on the poster. Everywhere in the city. First question is, uh, Ed, why are the the nails so dirty? <laughs> Thank you for the question. <laughs> uh, well, I made them dirty. I put the dirt under there, but uh, but not really. But it, it's um, I put sort of um, brown and black and stuff on a JPEG um, that constitutes the under the nail bed of the. So the 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 model comes. Uh, the skin, all of the levels of skin, so there's a lot of different layers of dermis, as there are with, with all of us, but uh, there are nearly as many on a 3D model as there are with a human, and you, you treat each one differently, so one layer will just be the veins, which you barely see, but they need to be there, um, and then another layer is a kind of uh, specularity, and then for the fingernails, for example, there's a layer underneath the, the nail. Um, actually, I painted it on top of the nail, so it's more like a nail varnish, actually. You can see this sort of strange pink bit under the nail. It's a bit, it's wrong, in fact, totally wrong. So, um, uh, yeah, but, but the figure is of the, the hands and the head are, are all kind of uh, sooty and dirty and uh, beaten up. Yeah. yeah so, so the question is, it could be a kind of fashion if you say it's not real. Uh, yeah, you know? right. uh, so yeah. that's that's a kind of interesting ambivalence always in in the characters that they yeah. they are multi-layered in a way. Yeah. But um, if I look at this poster, it's everywhere in the city. I, I ask myself, uh, is it a part of the story of a character? Mm -hmm. Or is there a? You know, of course, if you see the character, he's. Um, He seems to be uh, signed by yeah, some hard things in his life. Um, but if I see a hand like this, I would say it's a working class person or it's a person that has a kind of catastrophe in, in the moment yeah. to solve. Well, he actually the skin started off. So I've been using that particular male model for a little bit. And uh, in a previous work, he went through a kind of degeneration. So over the course, I think it's, it's about a two hour long, very strange monologue performance that this, just the head and the hands give. And he starts off immaculate. And then over the course of the thing, he's, he just gets worse and worse. And, and, but also his stubble grows out. And everything is kind of uh, gratuitous. Everything becomes more than it would in reality, you know. So uh, making him 
uh, beaten up, making him sort of weathered, as if he'd gone through a lot of analog things. Uh, I, you know, every single thing that I could change, I, I changed. So I put crap under his fingernails as if he'd been clawing at something or toiling in the in the mud, uh, laboring. And then he's got a sort of black eye and a lot of caked in crap, you know, which then he sweated through or cried through. So everything, it's, it's a sort of, just sort of building up layers and, and, and more layers. But also, I guess, I mean, the peculiar thing for me is, you know, abusing him in this way, which involves stretching out his JPEG skin and going in with Photoshop and, and sort of honing a nice shiny bruise under his eye or, or planting. It's a, it's a very strange thing. And then, you know, you, you uh, re-render the scene so that you can see the way that the skin is starting to look a bit more like crepe paper or something, or, or it's a bit sweaty and... Yeah, it's a yeah, yeah, no, no. If you brush. see uh, fingers like this, uh, you know, they are in a way amplified. Huh? The, the mm -hmm. dirt is more dirty than yeah. I would say. It, maybe it should be in real life. And in the same way, I would say everything on the character is amplified. Yeah? You, you, if you, if you um, design a detail like this, you can't speak with a normal voice. Mm. It sounds always very close. Well, I think it's also that, that everything that this figure is a sort of surrogate for um, gets sort of softened in the digital process. Uh, or I mean sort of uh, made more murky like it's sort of seen through. So it's less convincing, obviously. I mean, it's, it's barely convincing. So in order to approach a point of kind of uh, more or less realistic uh, verity or whatever, um, it's pushing it to this cartoon level. Like it's a caricature of someone that's a bit knackered or a, a sort of someone that's been beaten up. So everything, yeah, it's tr true. You know, you're kind of pushing it to a level of vivid, I, in the same way a cartoon would work, you know. But because I think it's, it's, it's very, you're very immediately aware that it's not real at all, that in order to even feel uh, some sort of uh, em empathic kind of connection, you have to sort of push it to a level of corporeal horror that I think, um, yeah. Um, in the moment before we came on stage, we have been in the exhibition and saw uh, the film. And um, there was this moment uh, in, the, in the white room, in the white space, yeah. uh, we saw the character walking. And you told me it was very complicated to design this kind of walk. Why? Well, it's, it, it's not complicated. It's just really hard to get it looking at even <coughs> remotely like someone walking. More, more so, someone walk, walking unobserved, you know. Unobserved. Yeah, like as if they're not performing walking, they're just walking. So they're not even aware that they're walking. We talked about this, but this, this idea, and you were saying actually in, in the theater that just that the natural is the hardest thing in the world to do, you know, to, to just walk across the stage without someone going, Christ, look at that walk, or, you know. Like, <laughs> you're constantly aware of the fallacy. It's just at what level, you know, that you're... So, I suppose for me it's important because the whole thing is so artificial. I just go with the kind of inadequacy. So his walk is sort of flapping and 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 sort of robotic, but also a little bit mannered, a little bit you know, a little bit camp or something. You know, and he's kind of like I think allowing yourself for it to be artificial uh, and be interested in the artifice is very different to say theatre that requires. Uh, a certain kind of thing that requires sort of naturalism where you want no one in the audience to be aware of the acting, right? You want them to constantly be sold on the character. It must be a blessing if an actor gets given a role with a limp so mm -hmm. that they've got a thing that they can do, you know, thank God, you know, I can pretend again. But to just walk, it's, it's crazy. Just walk is impossible, I would yeah. say. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so because uh, it's not the, the, the problem of walk, it's the, it's the problem of framing. If you are on stage, everything you do is not, uh, basically, it's not natural, it's yes. staged. And yes. then you have to find a kind of translation to make it natural again. Uh, the name of the exhibition is uh, Corpsing. Yeah. So what is about Corpsing? Well, this, uh, this 
is a, I think I've wanted to title something corpusing for a long time because it's just sort of ridiculously apposite. And, you know, titles function like that, they just sort of rattle around. But actually, as, a, as an idea, it's also became a kind of, um, like a super interesting, uh, very complicated uh, understanding of making decisions that sort of expose the fallacy of something, but also affirm a kind of reality or vice versa, or, or something way more striated than that. Um, so it's a term which I think is, is British, English, uh, theatrical, for someone either sort of forgetting their lines or cracking up, starting laughing. They drop character in some way, that they're suddenly present again, that the person, not the character, takes over. Um, and I, th I think, I mean, it's all apocryphal, but I think the idea that the term comes from someone who's supposed to be playing a dead body on stage, you can see that they're breathing or that they sneeze or something, or something, something that really very much underscores the fact that they're neither dead nor that character, nor, nor in fact, you know, and so I suppose corpsing is good because it's sort of, it's the most extreme performance that you're not giving. So you're supposed to be dead, but you're not, you know, and that, that kind of, that level feels, yeah. But at the same time, it's also just when you watch the blooper reel at the end of a movie or something, you watch all the actors fuck up their lines and it's funny and it's sort of endearing because you see them actually laughing, you know? <laughs> and uh, that kind of humanity that rushes forwards, I think, at a certain point, if you see someone, uh, and maybe you, you kind of, your empathy rushes to meet them because they're desperate on stage and you can feel their vulnerability suddenly, you know. But it's also a failure in some way. So it, it's something that I think editing-wise and the relationship between real and unreal in the work is sort of rehearsing this idea, I think. So if I see your films, I always see mistakes. Let's say uh, there are fuzzles on the... Uh, oh, malfunction. Uh, malfunction. Sorry, yes. yeah, 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 ma yeah. Malfunction, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Not male function, I'm sorry. Not male function. <laughs> malfunction. <laughs> Male function is uh, different. I thought you were going to talk about masturbation or something. It's like a <laughs> <laughs> you know, function, yeah. Yeah, but it's this, uh, let's say, uh, the, the crack in the picture yeah. that let's see both sides of the picture. Yes. The and picture and the, the creator. Is a, is yeah. a deliberate artifice as well. As in there is no decision that hasn't been made, including all of the apparent errors. So every single thing, but error or is a kind of fallible thing and therefore a relatable thing and therefore a kind of that's an error but but the you know what i mean so if something goes wrong i always used to think about it like um if right now i farted or something that there would be this kind of uh like it wouldn't it, it would be an error and it would change the atmosphere in the room and the smell and everything <laughs> But it would really, it would be like a, I don't know, and I wanted that feeling, what happens in that space that's opened up in the face of a kind of more or less coherent, we accept this thing, this is the way it should be, go, fluent thing. And then, and I suppose that as a kind of man, uh, like a method of editing or something, you know, would be, uh, was always interesting to me. How do you, how do you achieve that? that kind of effective space of fallible mistake, you know, I, I fuck my lines up or I, or I farted or whatever, you know, yeah. I mean, there's, in the theatre world, there is a tradition of um, working with this difference between creator and figure. Yes. Uh, also, the, the actor is not the creator. And, uh, the actor is the one for Bertolt Brecht, who presents the character. Yes. Uh, it's verfremdung, it's, it's, it's something that is, um, let's say, a non-illusionism in, in, in the performance that remembers the audience that this is not real, yes. that this is real theater. And um, very often I, I have the feeling that you show the instruments of uh, illusion, that you, um, have these moments of breaking illusions mm. uh, installed in the narration or in the style of the pictures, or is it to become more real? Or uh, I think it's probably to become uh, more 
more artificial or something. You know, that it's sort of... Because they're all controlled and they're not real, they're not actually showing the mechanism. Because I don't really know what the mechanism is. You know, there's a lot of computer... Th I mean, I can't even say the right words. You know, I don't even know the term. Not computer stuff that is happening that I can't expose. It's not... It doesn't have a, a sort of, you know, um, a thing that... It, there's no revelation. I can't sort of pull back the curtain and show you the Wizard of Oz or whatever. You know, I would probably just you would see a chipboard and I, or a thing, and I don't, or some zeros and ones, or at any point there's a kind of level of ignorance that I have to encounter. So in a way, the thing, the structures that I show as a mistake, is yet more uh, fakery. But it's also quite reassuring. There's a kind of um, even though it's like analog mistakes. Um, which would never happen in a computer animation or something. So um, lens flares on the on the you know there's no lens obviously and and depth of field or dust or or someone stopping speaking or, or any of those things that are um, I, th I think I, I think it's part of a kind of thing that everyone is dealing with all the time in terms of you know the success of technology seems to either operate in that kind of Arthur C. Clarke way as like indistinguishable from magic or in a way that is reassuringly familiar, like a thing we already had. It's just that it's doing it really efficiently and through magic. <laughs> but it looks a bit like a Walkman or it still looks a bit like a phone or, or it's got some reassuring weight to it because that matters. And like all of those analog reassurances that allow us to engage with artificial, with, with, with what, you know, with a kind of digital something, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> one moment of the fascinating um, technology, uh, fascin fascination from the technology is that it becomes so real, that it becomes hyper real. Yeah. Uh, you, you can come so close to the uh, skin of a person that uh, it's unreal. Uh, it's it's not natural. It it becomes ugly, and very often in your work, I have the feeling the closer you come to things uh, that traditionally feel good, if you come close, becomes ugly. Uh, flesh, uh, also the the language that that ends in something, if you come too close to the Don't meaning. I think I think I think there's a few things there. I think that uh, in a way, being asked to be that intimate to things that are that are doing a really horrible kind of parody of human experience is kind of repulsive and uh, re repellent, literally, you know, wanting to not, not be that close to something that's not real, um, that is asking that kind of intimacy. But, but also that exactly that thing of um, uh, technologies of representation, I suppose that they're, they're increasing, but they're increasing in one direction predominantly, which is, fidelity to the look of reality you know the the 4k or something or whatever it is now i don't know 8k probably 16. 16k well there you go i mean that's but isn't that there's a point at which it's sort of just bafflingly uh, it's too much it's an overload of information i mean now i think i used to think a lot about hd you know as a thing as it, that now sounds so anachronistic to even say hd because it Technology has moved so so quickly that HD is is less than the resolution of that phone or something, you know. So, um, but I remember watching watching stuff, you know, and exactly that kind of repulsive uh, level of you know, digital video, particularly at 1080p, um, being really cheap looking. It's sort of almost the reality was a way to reintroduce an economy of things looking sort of normal, you know? <laughs> like, suddenly actors looked like people again rather than uh, beautiful ethereal gods or something, you know? And, and yeah, we weapons look plastic and hobbits look like hobbits, you know, whatever. Or they look like they're wearing a load of makeup. There was a thing, do you remember this thing of, um, I think they shot, Peter Jackson shot The Hobbit at 4K and 3D and and all the makeup artists were kind of having to work double time because, because the cameras can see so much more. So they couldn't get away with little sort of things. So every seam around every prosthetic ear or whatever had to be. 
and and it was shot at 48 frames a second or something. I, I don't I can't remember the details, but it but it was audiences responded with revulsion. You know, one it looked fake, completely fake because it looked too real. So you could see it looked like a pantomime or something. And then also, yeah, anyway, but it, yeah. yeah. In German, we have this double meaning of the word uh, Auflösung, uh, a very high solution. Auflösung means disappearing at the same time. So if you, if you go very close to something, uh, the something is uh, dissoluted, so it disappears. Okay. Uh, so that, that's in the, in, the, in the word. Yeah. Auflösung, uh, usually we pay uh, for getting higher and higher and higher uh, resolutions, but uh, the same in the same way, uh, the meaning of the word is also uh, it disappears because uh, the particles are so tiny and tiny and tiny yeah. that they become not real anymore. I mean, that, I suppose that's well, I, a couple of things. That thinking about um, that sort of Pascal thing, where the infinitely large and the infinitely small meet at a point, you know, the, uh, the infinite, I guess. But also thinking about um, a, a very great B-movie. You might have seen The Invisible Man, or The Incredible Shrinking Man, sorry, not The Invisible Man, The Incredible Shrinking Man, where he starts off and, and he gets sort of sprayed with some radioactive dust somewhere. And then over the course of like a year, he just keeps shrinking um, until he... He sort of disappears to humans, but he does battle with a spider in the basement, and then and he has this sort of pin, uh, and then and it, the film ends with him just sort of entering the microcosmic, you know, like he just keeps going, and it's such an extraordinary thing that he's disappearing from from everything, from the possibility of representation, from he's entering sort of just thought or something. It's really it's nuts. It's a really, but exactly that that kind of. Um, it's nothing to do with it, is it? But, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, um, in your films, um, I think the transfer f from every kind of thing that seems to be real in something that is basically data, because digital art means it's uh, transferred into a medium that has no body in a way. Uh, it's, it's, of course, there are. Um, computers and so on, but um, in the same time we see that the result of this technology becomes more and more real, mm. or also the characters becomes more and more real, uh, let's say hyper real. Mm. Um, and um, basically it's, it's a kind of cultural, let's say, movement that brings everything of our life into this digital existence. Mm -hmm. uh, if, we, if we use Facebook or if we uh, use uh, social media, everything is transferred into this sphere of, let's say, non-materialistic mm -hmm. uh, existence. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the same time, I would say it's done to give us experiences. If I think about your, your let's say, problem, it's a nice problem with the idea of corpsing. Uh, it's also related to something that is close to the industry of experience, of, of mm -hmm. feelings. Huh? Mm -hmm. So is there a relation between capitalism and, let's say, aesthetics in this way? <laughs> yeah, I, totally. I mean, it's, what's weird is, is precisely the, the operational aspect of faking error in order to, you know, like at a point of recuperation, that to to turn the mistake into a a value, a useful thing, a valuable thing means. I mean, there's there's something hugely monopolizing, totalizing about that world. You know, that everything can well not. I mean, what's weird is I think that everything that I make is 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 deeply amateur. You know, it's not professional, insofar as it's not, it wouldn't pass muster in a cinema. If you were going to see a, a new computer generated animation thing, and this is, this is the quality that it was <laughs> offering, you, you know, it's, it's shit in a way. But, but precisely that kind of, um, I suppose I think that that, that, that sort of uh, economizing of experience and things is within the technology 
but I would hope that within my work is a kind of um, <coughs> self-harming kind of reflexivity in terms of the use of the technology, that it's sort of undoing its own attempt or its own promise of what it, what it could save us from is that it can't and that, that part of that is the kind of the, the sort of the, the hit of the work potentially is a kind of return. I mean, I think that part of the answer is, is to do with abjection, is to do with the uses of abjection, particularly now in the face of um, what you were describing, a kind of ubiquitous digitalization, and therefore the illusion of a dematerialization, when actually the, uh, in every other way it's, it's becoming way more material, I suppose. So in a way, acts of retrieval, where you, you, you're returned, or not you are returned, or you choose to return by encountering certain um, non-economized experiences, um, the non-experience, the kind of banal, the, the, the dead leg or the, the pins and needles or something, you know, the kind of base levels of experience those things that are seldom attempted to even be recuperated, let alone represented or, or, or turned into spectacle, I suppose. Is that... Yeah, I, I think from one aspect, very important aspect of your work is a kind of sabotage. Mm. Uh, you, uh, you're always constantly, uh, in a way, remembering the medium you bring yourself as an author in. You make you visible. You, yes. you, we see characters uh, in the situation of seeing. Yes. We see them, but we also see how they see. Yes. They very often look on screens. They are seen by cameras. Mm. Uh, so seeing uh, pictures who are related to pictures, yes. to the generation of pictures, and we see generated pictures of... So there, there is a kind of honesty uh, about the material. The material is not any more naive. Mm. Uh, we don't film a person. The person is always uh, made and yeah. you show how it's done by malfunctions. Yes. For example. But also that it's, yeah, that it, you know, a lot of the time, actually less in these videos, but in other videos, the character is breaking the fourth wall. As in, even the understanding of its complete artifice and its uh, and its sort of reflexivity or its self sabotage, self self harm, um, is m even even at the point where it understands that it's still desperate to claw back a kind of um, uh, faithfulness. You know, like it's no, 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 don't leave. You know, trust this thing. You know, there's a kind of pitch still. It's still pitching even as the skin's coming off or whatever. You know. Even as you can see the yeah. the workings underneath, those. I mean, in a way, I think that the going back to what you were saying before about showing showing the workings or the kind of structural aspects, the very fact that it it I think it's a kind of dissimulation or a sleight of hand, a little magic trick where it's trying to show you the wrong failure. So here, how about this one that will actually bring you closer when actually the the entire image is made up of a failure to convince, in a way, you know. So, but just not on the terms that the character might want, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting because uh, your, your character seems to me uh, never been heroes. So could you imagine to, to do a film about a hero, or is this kind of character a hero for you? I mean, is he a hero in, in what? I, I, I suppose, that in a way, character isn't, isn't right. I mean, I, because they have no backstory, they've just sort of arrived. And because they're being honest in terms of their image in relation to their constitution, so they can't help but be honest, they have to just be a temporary cipher, you know, like a, they're just a little surrogate thing that, you know, in, like if I was describing a story and I was putting the glass there for the house, and they're, they're stand ins, you know, they're. they're um, but they're, they're, I suppose their total sort of melancholic yeah. aspect. 
I mean, I suppose I would tend to think of melancholy in the sort of Freudian sense of something of not acknowledging the lost object, which in their case is everything, <laughs> mm. um, but instead those that thing manifests as an infinite number of neuroses and neurotic behavior that is happening and trying to compensate and repressing and, you know, rather than ever getting to a point of uh, reparative mourning where you can actually they could maybe acknowledge the fact that they're not real and that they're trapped in this nothing, you know, but that would require so much more on my part. But I can't, no, I can't imagine making a hero. I always see how they try to be uh, strong. They try right. to survive the situations because they, for me, they're always in a kind of encounter with the system. Yeah. Uh, and they are more the uh, the material of the system than the user of the system. They are used by the system, uh, Absolutely, yes. especially in your new film. Mm. Um, um, and that's interesting because um, it's a very, I would say, strange idea of what a character is. He is not the one who is the... Um, you know, who, who brings the narration uh, uh, to, to, let's say, to a development. He is developed by something. Um, and this is maybe also the melancholic point. Uh, if you speak about melancholy, um, what would your um, definition be for the melancholy of our days? Uh, well, I, th I suppose, like I said, I think it, I, I think it has to be something that you don't recognize as the source of it, you know. So that there are lots of, I guess, contemporary cultural studies or sociological kind of stuff around things like gender melancholy, where people are operating neurotically in relation to the, the, the gender that they're not which might manifest as kind of homophobia or something like that. Or, but so fundamentally kind of carrying the kind of Freudian towards a kind of more interesting area, I guess, where... I mean, it's, it's interesting. So um, certain people have sort of tried to turn psychoanalysis uh, analysis into a sort of uh, material thing by talking about neuro... Mm -hmm. uh, plasticity in a way so this is like Catherine Malibu a lot of that kind of re, re returning to trauma as a physical thing that happens to the brain you know um, and then it manifests as the kind of uh, figuration of trauma which psychoanalysis might be more familiar with so it's a really interesting kind of doubling back on itself in a way um, so I, I suppose <laughs> part of the kind of the overly material performance of this stuff. I'm going to try and make sense of what I'm saying now. Um, it just, I suppose because this stuff, I'm just going to not finish that thought at all. Uh, a lot of this stuff, because it has this insistence on, on a kind of material experience, like most of the things that the characters do are, are physical things. They don't do many kind of daydream, I mean they do a lot of substance stuff, pissing and uh, wanking or whatever, or, or, or eat, trying to eat stuff, or just feeling like crap or whatever. And, um, and yet the medium itself is obviously not there. It's not, it's not tangible like that. So I suppose for me, the relationship, just to go back a time, between a kind of the figurative or a metaphoric application of psychoanalytic sort of understanding with say, a material, a very base physical one, but one which is actually of the brain, somehow those, those interrelations between... Uh, you asked me about melancholy, didn't you? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, there was, uh, was an idea. I always have the feeling that your characters are in a kind, of, a kind of witness. They see something and they make experience with something, but they can't change it. So 
a typical moment of melancholy is mm. uh, it's, it's an idea of uh, a thought of uh, W. G. Seabelt. He says uh, melancholy is if you see what's happening or what's going on, uh, but you are agree with it's not to change. Right. The things are going as they go, and uh, it's not your task to change, right. but to be the witness or something like this. Yeah. That makes melancholic. Yeah, okay, that, thank you. That's a much better definition than <laughs> where I was going. That's really, I mean, I suppose then that's gonna, that, that feels endemic, doesn't it? It feels like a totally ubiquitous sensation of helplessness, but also the necessary submission to, well, not even necessary, but you know, like, like in order to just carry on, you have to just carry on, which is, has this kind of horrible uh, inaction to it. or or a limbo, or purgatorial kind mm -hmm. of thing of mm -hmm. just like accepting fate, I suppose. And it's weird because I don't. I suppose I don't. I, I didn't necessarily mean for this stuff to allegorize people's um, inaction. Because I it, because I'm because I do always think within the structure of the medium. I'm sort of always putting the character. You know. Oh yeah. How would they? How would it? bit of code think about the, th you know, like everything has a sort of, a, f a kind of a fierce undoing logic about its own const construction, you know. Um. Always if I see the film um, downstairs, I, I hear this sound we know from waiting halls, from the airport or from, from the train stations. Yeah. This uh, Dreiklang, I don't know. Uh, da, 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 da. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but what you described now is, a kind of an announcement. Yeah. There is no announcement. No. It's just a sound. Well, it, it's also it's always a cue. Yeah. So when he's wandering around in the white, whistling um, that tune, the Polovotsk and dance. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. It's a Borodin, a very famous thing. Anyway, it turned into a Frank Sinatra thing or whatever. Strangers in the night. Um, but and then yeah, that every time that. Da -da 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 -da, he sort of stops and turns as if as if operated on a thing, you know. Like it's everything is done with total acceptance, you know. You you, you once told me that um, everything is starting with writing for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so also you you're writing your characters in two languages. Uh, by, by the way, you are a great writer. Thanks. Um, <laughs> your books are really um, great literature, and I would say in a way. The technique of the books, it's very close to your films. Yeah. But the writing of your films are uh, different because they are, for, for example, um, written in the language of programming um, uh, films, or it's not the, the usual language we use. Well, it's interesting that, just to hold on to that, because I think you know, the expediency of like a, a pencil or a pen and a bit of paper, um, which doesn't which tends to not really limit, you know, you, feel, you don't feel limited by that necessarily. Um, whereas, obviously most of this stuff is, is done through software, which is already installed on another bit of software. And the, you know, the, the levels of control, in a way, so, you know, if you do something wrong in a 3D animation program, it just won't work, you know. But it's not that I'm writing code, I suppose. I can't. I'm a, I'm a consumer of the tool set. So I don't, I don't invent the tool, um, nor the palette, nor, in, in fact, nothing. <laughs> you know, it's just, I just wield it badly or deliberately wrong. You know, it's the kind of mis, 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 uh, the inappropriate use of these things. Sorry, yes. But the, but, uh, yes. Yeah, in, in a way, in your, um literature, you use a kind of published language. Yeah? Very often the language is pre-published. It's, yeah. it's, it's the language of, let's say, a discourse or a Regurgitated. terms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> then you have the another level of uh, a very um, effective language, that is the language of body, yeah. uh, of excessive needs and experiences. Yeah. And this is something that comes together also in your films. Totally. Uh, you have the surface of uh, the security films in the in the airport in the airplane yeah. uh, in a way yeah. uh, much more interesting of course but right. uh, it's it's uh, it's the same um, 
cold and septic, uh, aseptic uh, surface. Absolutely, yeah. And then you go into it with different needs. Yeah. It's really, I mean, that goes back to corpsing in a way, but controlling it, you know, like wanting to, which, we, you know, we talking to, talking to um, students at the sales show about trying to work out what, how do you, could you possibly fake corpsing, in a way, those moments? And in a way, not if everyone is expecting them or whatever. You know, there's a load of contingencies to that thing. But um, to me, the, the writing and the videos, are, they're made very similarly. You know, I'm, not, I'm never really interested in uh, narrative or, or like something that people lose themselves to. Or I'm interested in only pulling people in close enough so that the, the fling back is dramatic enough, you know. So the this is an idea in a way developed through bathos, you know. This again, sort of British Alexander Pope, um, satirical actually, kind of taking the piss out of um, purple prose writing poets of uh, of his time, and and uh, this this idea of bathos where someone is sort of going off into some sort of reverie of sublime transcendent cosmic whatever and then it and then it's sort of it's like a list that would involve the moon and the stars and and then it ends with you know a, a dog shit can you can you explain this idea of bathos yeah I, i'm trying i think it's, it's not very good at it, but this uh, sort of uh, or the way it, it feels like it's practiced is um um Two ways, I guess, is deliberate and maybe inadvertent. So someone uh, writing uh, overly thesaurized kind of language that is really trying to lap at poetic, lyrical uh, drama, you know, romantic, um, sublime, whatever. And, that, and that, that reality sort of appears at the end as a kind of either an insufficiency in the writer or an insufficiency in the aspirations of that kind of transcendence, that in the end it's kind of, you know, ooh. Uh, and actually, the, for a long time I've been sort of writing, uh, just starting down roads and then killing it with an etc. Uh, you know, like a list that might be kind of, and that etc. somehow it has to incorporate the entire universe in it. You know, <laughs> sort of, it's almost getting bored of the attempt at convincing everyone that this thing is beautiful or real or whatever and then you go, ah, fuck it you know there's a kind of uh, giving up but how to control that and turn that into a, a thing where people are genuinely uh, reaching to climax or reaching to whatever and then locking it off your work seems to me very often it's a kind of real vir virtuality no? um, mm -hmm. but you go one step forward and you destroy the, um, the artificial um, um, clearness. Uh, you, you, you destroy the pureness. You, 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 you bring something in that is the body, that is something that is um, mortal, that is something that uh, is out of control and takes its place. I think it's also feeling that something is being forced, you know, there's a, which I guess is feeling violence, that the manipulations are violence. There's a, there's a In which way? I suppose I mean like uh, the, fa the fact that, you know, it, the sensation might be that these, these figures uh, aren't in control. Um, and similarly, I think that the ways in which, at least intentionally the videos are often flirting with genre or things that I could maybe presume most people would be fluent in you know and ah oh yeah you know like this music surging like that tells me to feel this and so everyone has that kind of um, uh, that kind of double edge where they're able to go with it but still be aware of its manipulations or something um, but those kinds of structures. I suppose I mean that, that, that uh, everything that I make these characters do or go through is more or less nasty, you know. No one gets off 
Well, a lot of them get off with a kind of just a boredom, you know. But but most of the time, that I, it's a sort of modelling something where I can uh, my controls the the kind of symbolic order of the violence becomes because the symbolic order of this is the same. You know, they can both it can have a kind of uh, really real, <laughs> really violent thing according to its own. What was your question? Sorry. I think um, it's about the technology to make it, I, yes. I would say, um, immersive and not immersive in the same time. Yes. Yeah? You once told me that um, the real aim of your work is the body of the audience, mm. to go into, um, let's say, a physical experience of yeah. the people that is um, given by moments who are very... Um, very su subtle, uh, you know, the, the sound of uh, nails on a glass or yeah. metal, yeah. Or all, all the sound uh, um, files you create for the films are so intense, yeah. so um, um, they immerse you, if you want or not, uh, you are in the situation of the character just by listening yeah. what you see. So that that I suppose in a way that that's a kind of that's like an instinctive it's a gut response like like if someone else vomits you wretch or something you know so there is a very visceral aspect to that but I in terms of that kind of push and pull of immersion and rejection uh, that's I guess that's more what I meant about bathos because I think that the way that immersion is often used particularly in relation to technology and it is usually spoken of in relation to technology, not um, something, you know, like it's funny. Yeah. It has to be to do with... Feel good yeah, uh, losing moment. Losing yourself, yeah. escapism or, or whatever. Put this on and forget your troubles and imagine you're in a forest or whatever. Which is not something I'm even remotely interested in. There's always that, uh, that more punitive sense of don't forget you're a real person. And that's not, it's not about that being bad but it's more about like what's I don't get the interest in in Im immersion as a I mean it's to me it's, it sounds sinister right it's a kind of it has an ideological f it becomes a term of an industry in yeah, a way. Of course. Also, like, huh? yeah and the more immersive the better uh, yeah we're rather rather than we're all pretty well immersed already in being and stuff um, and I think, I, I don't know, I think for me, I've always been, I've always thrilled around the point of, um, I guess, th functional things like irony, but they're part of the kind of broader family of irony where you get to have a double sort of understanding of something. So if I put on a virtual reality helmet, and I quite like thinking about how bad it is, or the f helmet, or like, and I think that most technologies like to demonstrate their limit, you know, they can't help but kind of describe how crap they are finally at doing the thing that they've been invented to do. You know, there's always that mm -hmm. kind of, okay, you know, the next blockbuster will, will always have a moment where they've got a new fangled possibility within the, the technology, but they want to show it off. But it means somehow re-describing artifice and, and killing the whole thing, I suppose. <laughs> um, but I, but that thing of wanting people to r remain in their bodies and remain in themselves, you know, whatever, was always um, was in relation to the disappearance of the material, or the apparent disappearance of the material in a lot of digital sort of things, you know, well not even the disappearance, but just sending it over there, you know, that there is an idea that. Um, we don't have to encounter that stuff a lot anymore. And that would include... The dirt under the nails. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that would also include the medium, you know. It yeah. would include even, the, you know, like the little plastic uh, teeth. When you pull a CD out, they would sort of come off and rattle around. Or, or the scratches on a CD or, or a DVD. And all of that's sort of gone. I mean, you might get times when the, the thing doesn't work. But a lot of the time, we just stream things from wherever the fuck, you know, some some no no place that we don't have to encounter. And I suppose, therefore, and I was always interested in sort of anti-illusionary moving image stuff and structural moving image work. But what happens to that imperative, the idea of that as a sort of um, 
ethical or political experience in front of a medium that is based in illusion, which is the moving image, you know, mm. um, what happens to that when there is no medium? How do you find that again, that kind of reattaching of reality to something? And I think by addressing the only physical thing left in the room, which is someone's body, which hasn't changed, um, that's, that feels like a way to kind of, it's almost like hunting down the, the, the indexical thing, which is... You know. So uh, one criteria for immersion is forgetting the media. Right, yes. Yeah? Uh, you are immersed if you forget that this is the book in your hands right. or the film you see or yeah. uh, the film under the VR. So wh wh what you bring in is, in a way, the author mm. and also the media itself. It's always um, part of the game to, to know what is the game. Yes, yes. And, but weirdly, I find that the most moving thing in the world. I, th I find that the kind of, the, you know, the eternal fallibility of anything, always wanting to break something in order to prove that it doesn't, that it isn't good enough or something, that it's not the thing, thank God, you know, that it's actually, <laughs> that it's... So, and I think it, the same for me is totally true of any uh, art form, you know, uh, uh, mu music, literature, structural things where you can feel the pressure and the burden of the system uh, or the, the skeleton, the scaffold appear and then maybe sink back down beneath the kind of... <laughs> it's, such a, uh, it's such a privilege in a way and it sort of reaffirms a human... It, it affirms the author and therefore the, the structure and therefore the making something up. And therefore, something amazing like art, you know, <laughs> that, that it's not, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I think we should be immersed from the audience now. Sure. <laughs> so if you have questions, um, this is the moment when we start to uh, be open for your um, thoughts and remarks. Uh, don't hesitate. Um, what time is it? <laughs> I think it's time. Yeah, exactly. Susanne. So by making the um, audience conscious of the inabilities and the malfunctions of, of the technique, yeah. could, could, would you say your work and the impetus of your work is a critique, is a technique critique, or would that go too far? And that's too strongly one side, one no, sided. I think in terms of the way that critique doesn't necessarily have a positive or negative, it's just about a kind of taking a part of something in order to understand it. Like I suppose that's that's how I would understand like critique being fundamentally ambivalent rather than it being like, I'm critical of uh, the technology, which of course I am, but I'm also really excited by it because it can do some amazing things and it can sort of present, it can, pre it can present perspectives on, on artifice and reality that, that are really new to me, definitely, you know, and, and as someone that m fiddles with this stuff and, and, and is constantly also abutting my own inability to know what, how to do something. You know, and that's when I would have recourse to other people who, or I'd go online and look at forums and things. So, um, yeah, I don't, I, I, it's not about sort of hating on tech, I don't think, because it, it sort of affords so much, but it's definitely about remembering other things as well and con conf confusing the kind of hegemony of the way that technology might function, you know, that actually it's sort of supplanting of roles within our lives. I always th thought that, you know, the, the kind of, I can't remember who said it, but something about like a proper definition of sort of contemporary cybernetics was more of a kind of uh, willful giving over of aspects, of things that you had to do previously to bits of technology. So you, I don't have to remember the time. I don't have to know the time, of course, but I also don't have to remember when I'm supposed to do anything. I don't really have to remember anyone's phone number, and I don't have to remember, you know, like there's a shit ton of stuff that I can just give over, which, is, which should really liberate me from anxieties, but really I just find other ones, right? You know, but 
but it's not that critical. Mm. I can hear you, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, because this uh, corpse thing happened to me two times during watching um, the video. Like once when uh, the room starts spinning, yeah. and then on the other hand, when I was I was totally alone actually, and I was moving around in the in the place, and then I had this feeling because I I was seeing the video uh, at the same time all over in the whole uh, room and uh, moving through the room and just being totally like this happened to me so yeah. just want to hear you speaking about the installation and how why it's like on um, as many screens as it is and like the different size i think i, I hear you speaking about the size because like yeah yeah it's really um i uh, all credit to the mmk for allowing me to do that really because it felt like such a basically the piece was made to be reiterated to be repeated again and to have that so the first time it was shown was in uh, this island in the Bosphorus near Istanbul as part of the Biennale in this very very run down uh, derelict mansion on two floors but you walk in and, and you, you enter one floor and it's there and then you go upstairs and it's there again and I suppose I very simply wanting s wanting to keep underlining the thing you know in one regard like no you'll have to watch it again you know like there's that insistence on on and then what does that mean you know like what happens in the in the repetition it's also very formal so the the form of all of these videos and most installed moving image stuff is a loop and so that becomes often the kind of uh the trap that the characters are in also the kind of the <laughs> the the point where the screen the the floor gives w the screen flickers uh it's a uh, i hope a sort of horrible moment because it's the same above and it's the same again and the same again and then to a point where it sort of blurs into infinite infinity and the homogeneity of this world its complete t uh formal homogeneous aspect i kind of wanted to insist on that and then the the different sizes obviously the medium itself and the projected image is infinitely it's not infinitely plastic of course it would look terrible really 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 big but um but that and also what that feels like so the bedroom scene is is built to be 169 ratio so it fits in the thing and when you encounter it in one room it's sort of approaching the proscenium theater sort of thing and then in another it's a sort of awkward doll's house and what that I suppose again it's like how that feels in relation as a body to a space that's not there or th that never was there. So all of those things um but yeah definitely the sort of the moment of realizing it's all the same um and also of of, of then submitting to the idea that within that repetition is vast difference as well. So you yeah I suppose yeah. Okay, thank you. What I really um, appreciate on your work is a paradox situation because usually you have a progress in the music, for example, in your new in your new work, mm. it's the bolero, yeah. but you can join in the film in any time, and you will never be too late. Mm -hmm. But in the same time, it's a final direction of um, progression. Yeah. So also uh, in in Hisser, you can join in whenever. It uh, fits for you. Yeah. Uh, there is no beginning and no end. Maybe there is an end, but in the same time, it's always a beginning in the story. So this is something that is very rare and very special uh, because uh, usually it's a problem if you visit an exhibition and the film is running and you you come to the room and it's always too late or too early or whatever. In yeah. your films, you always can come in how do you do You're that always too late i think that's <laughs> it's only <laughs> the right time yeah no exactly uh they well again i think they they're kind of made very impatiently edi editing wise which is what i meant about the kind of like uh i can't be bothered with maintaining the appearance of this kind of metaphysical reverie because i need a wee or something you know like the kind of interruptive of of 
boredom or impatience or a cramp or all of those things are kind of reflected in the editing again. They're also not that long, you know? I think with the Bolero, you're very aware where we're going every time. And so is he, you know, it's not, there's no, finally there's no sort of surprise. We'll just do it again, you know it'll come round again. You know. In a way, there is a progress between the floors. Yeah, totally. <laughs> this, is, this is what's been really nice here, actually, is this chance to uh, just show two works, but really, uh, you know, emphasize... I mean, just having two, you get to kind of have the comparison between these things and the very different ways in which your, your body is asked to be in relation to them. You know, the comfort that may be in the far room on this ground floor when you get to the furthest screen of Hesse, you can sort of sit down with it because it's sort of, it's modest mm -hmm. in certain ways. Whereas, obviously, uh, safe conduct upstairs is deliberately, I mean, it's weird because it's sort of both, the, the, the technology is being tortured in some way because it's being hung from this thing. But at the same time, it's also uh, looking, looking at you with it. I mean, it's trying to overwhelm in that way, you know. Are there more questions? Yes, there are. Please. Um, you were talking about uh, malfunctions quite a lot, and you were talking about um, purposeful imperfections, little specks of dust on the screen. Like yeah. You put them there to give us the, the feeling of, of reality, which is obvious not the reality we live in, but yeah. kind of you want to give us this feeling. So there was this question coming to my mind, um, how you deal with the reproduction of your artworks? I mean, you're not drawing on paper, you're not painting on canvas, you're sending digital files to the museums you exhibit in. Yeah. So you kind of need to deal with this, um, with this imperfection of displaying it somewhere else outside of your office space. I mean, when you're working in front of your, I guess, calibrated screen, you have, <laughs> okay. <laughs> But I mean, you're working with, um, no, you're perceiving your work in a certain kind of way in front of your screen. And then you're putting this work somewhere else, and it cannot be recreated in the same way because it's a different surrounding. You're, you're displaying it on a beamer and so on, like on another beamer, you're on a projector. Yeah, yeah. And is this something you see as an imperfection which is also kind of purposeful, or is it something which doesn't really matter to you at all? It, it does matter a lot. I, I don't see it in the same sort of vein as, as managing the errors in a way or control it or faking them or whatever but more uh, i get very excited about like you know making this in a little room on a tiny s screen and then just saying yeah it'll be f four meters wide and there's no and i don't s sort of test it or anything there's just a kind of a jump at that point of like because i want to sort of whoosh away from in one regard i want to leave behind the spare bedroom with the computer in it and you know and then and, and but also bring along the other stuff with it so i mean i often imagine i sort of think that the more or less intimate kind of tenor of the work wouldn't really be there if i didn't sit there in a little th if i work with a big team of people or something it would be crazy you know the whole thing would fly out the window i suppose in a way another word for malfunction and and, and uh, error and stuff would be idiosyncrasies of a kind of a personal nature, you know, the, the decisions that are very opaque to someone else, but I make impulsively or whatever, you know, or I just like that. So those things, those insoluble things that one does, I think maybe they do relate to error as perceived outside of it, or, or better, just unknowable, incoherent things, you know. I'm going off somewhere else now, but I mean, when I'm speaking. <laughs> What was the... The question was, um, <laughs> <laughs> if the not ideal reproduction of your artwork is something which is, ah, no, it is consistency ideal of your work or is something it's a choice. you want to avoid? If it was about like being... If I was about m remaking the spare bedroom in the gallery, I'd be awful. You know, everyone would sort of like, uh, sit on the wheelie chair and, <laughs> and, and I'd, get, I'd get a double for my cat or something. It'd be really... So the, that, that kind of fidelity, I don't really mind losing because I feel like I've given enough of that world to the, to the work. And then, and then there's the kind of ridiculous shift of just saying it'll be in this room and we have to show it. 
you know, it's sort of ridiculously arbitrary because it's, I mean, I could put it on a phone, but there has to be a kind of act of, a sort of faithful thing of like, no, 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 it needs to be this big, it needs to be very loud, and it needs to be like this. And So all of those things, that's a different kind of um, fidelity to the work. That's like a one that I, um, that's not about uh, representational perfection or something. All right, thank you. Thanks. Since there's only one real object in the exhibition, which is the poster, with ha which has a, a citation on it uh, from Helen Keller, um, saying, um, avoiding danger is no uh, safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. I was wondering if uh, you tend to say, or um, the hisser uh, is going there saying that uh, virt that well when the citation was made helen keller um there was no internet or virtual space uh, so i think you hanging this poster in the exhibition is uh saying that um you should not all always stay in the virtual but al also stay or take part in the real world and also with the political um Act activism and uh, I think is this is this what, where you were going to because um, otherwise you could have used a real actor not a digital avatar and yeah. and also the I think you did a Malevich reference with the black square uh, square when the <laughs> which, which bit sorry the in Hisser when the room breaks into a six like in, into the black, yes. where you see the room from above. Yes, and, uh, and it becomes the, a, just a black square. Yeah, a black square on white, like the Malevich painting. Right. So I was wondering if, you, if you're if you making like a reference to the utopian potential that the internet had maybe in the 90s, uh, and that is now overrun by capitalist software um, producers. Um, oh. Well... Well, this is maybe... No, it's really, <laughs> going that's really exciting, but I... Um, if I'm honest, uh, the I think I think of the the sincerity of the poster is not really in the post. The post it's the material thing. It's like its form. I don't. I didn't really know who Helen Keller was. I mean, it's just it's just a poster I bought. I mean, literally, uh, but it's much smaller. And then I scanned it to put in the bedroom of Hissa, along with the cat one that sort of hang in there, and then the the um, Le, Le Chat Noir, sort of French bougie poster, <laughs> and then a sort of ceramic swan and stuff. It's, poor, it's sort of more set dressing, but then I really I liked, so I scanned it again at, at some ridiculous resolution because it's not a very big poster. It's like a little thing, um, but it was a sort of standard. It was like a stock. It's like a stock poster. That's a bedroom poster. So in a way, it's kind of meaning, like the Helen Keller thing and no fear and stuff, is sort of s very much secondary to its tone as a thing that's kind of complicated by what kind of material it is, what scale it is, what's it doing there, why is it the only thing. It's sort of toying with its own significance, I suppose, or its own s symbolic strength, or what it can carry, in a way. Um, the Black Square is totally accidental. I think, but the but um, and the sort of capitalist software thing, I think um, I don't know. I mean, I I'm not outside of that. I don't. I'm very much aligning. I hope in a way. I'm not. I, I mean, I just can't help but be a consumer or a or a prosumer or whatever or a creative consumer or whatever the right demographic nomenclature is or whatever you know. But just that kind of. Um, it's definitely not a sort of happy, dilettante amateur from the 19th century or something, but it's more, more a... Um, but I think g g being that role and sort of operating the software in particular ways and allowing the software, like what we were talking about, sort of trying to make the software, trying to undermine it, maybe not functionarily but ideologically, or it's sort of its desires are one thing and then my, mine are a different thing and trying to uh, uh, rebuff the software's desire, I guess. 
There's one more question here in the first row. Last question. <laughs> the last question. Okay. This is a question to the future. Any, uh, maybe that's a nice one to end the discussion with. I wonder what happens next to the figure that we encounter in his and Safe Conduct, because you explained earlier that this is a kind of character figure that have, you've yeah. been following over the years, and um, over the years it has become more and more degenerated, deconstructed, wounded, and in safe conduct it's pretty deconstructed already. So I wonder what, <laughs> is there a life? Of well, it, it, weirdly, it's a different, I've changed the model quite a number over the years, but because it's just some sort of generic white male idiot thing, <laughs> you can't really tell the difference. You can a little bit because of their function. So this guy has uh, better rigging, which means that he's, he can, he's more expressive, uh, and the resolution of his skin is better, and you know all of these things. Uh, he's gone, I think, uh, for now, because so I'm making some new new things um, for a show with Thomas, and um, there's a very different. He's not that different. <laughs> he <laughs> is not that different, but he's sufficiently different and of a very different age and a different sort of status. Uh, figure in the next stuff. What I'd really like to get past, I think, is a solitary male protagonist, though, I think. I think that there's a, I have a, it's a certain kind of um, cowardice on my part to speak only through what I can sort of safely appropriate, I suppose. I, I just mean that, you know, and also working alone, predominantly, there's another kind of, it's like, it, I mean, it's very similar to writing. Although increasingly, you know, I have to sort of outsource bits of stuff, which I, because I've fallen behind in my capacity to know what the hell is happening with 3D software and stuff. But still, essentially, I like to maintain the image of working alone, of being an author in that regard. And I wonder, yeah, I don't know. It feels like maybe that's the, that's the sort of proper next step would be to sort of relinquish the kind of monopoly that I have on on what I can show or make or something. Um, but yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, I mean, he sort of pulls all his guts out, you know, so, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So let's finish with this um, <laughs> promise. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Ed. Thank you, Thomas. Thank, thank you for your patience and interest. <laughs>